today we're looking at a cool story hidden within the structure of the Hebrew language and the spoken language of Jesus Aramaic. We did a previous video about the naming of Adam in the original biblical language of Hebrew. The thrust of that video was that the story was built into the structure of the Hebrew text. It's quite remarkable, but if you thought that God would just inspire that in just one of the names in the Bible, you'd be wrong. We're going to be discussing the connection between Joshua and Jesus and a story it reveals. I love me some Old Testament, and if you look really hard, you can see Jesus contained in those stories. I'm not breaking any new ground here to say that the story of Jesus is symbolized within the stories of famous biblical characters like Moses, Joshua, David, and even Jonah. But we're going to focus on two of those people today. Here's an overview. I would guess that most people have generally heard the story of Jonah. He was a reluctant prophet of God. When God called him to deliver a message to the people of Nineveh, an enemy of his people, Jonah ran away from God. He left his hometown to board a ship and sailed away in the opposite direction that God wanted him to go. There was a storm and Jonah gets thrown overboard to save the boat and the other men from dying. God prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. By the way, the Bible clearly called it a fish and not a whale. He spent three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, and then Jonah prayed to God, who spoke to the fish that spewed him out and onto dry land. All this to send the message to the people of Nineveh, who actually did repent from their sins. Now, I'm not going to get into whether this is just a made-up allegory or if this story is true, but this is in the Bible, and the connection is that Jesus directly referenced the story and compared it to himself. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So basically, Jesus was equating the three days he will be dead in the earth with the time Jonah spent in the belly of the fish. And we both know that both of them came out. Jonah came out from the fish, and Jesus resurrected and came out from the cave. That much is clear from the Bible. That is one aspect of Jonah's story that connects to Jesus. There are others, but we're not going to get into them right now. The other biblical person that connects to Jesus is Joshua. We know that Joshua was an assistant to Moses, but the very first time we hear of Joshua was this verse earlier in Exodus. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. That is no coincidence that the very first mention of Joshua was about him going to fight against the Amalekites. Joshua the warrior will become a major theme in the future. The beginning of the book of Joshua describes how the torch of leadership was being passed from Moses to Joshua as the people come to the promised land. So Joshua became the leader of the Israelites that fought the battles in order for the people to inherit the promised land of Canaan. And then, after defeating numerous kings and nations, Joshua then distributes the land to the twelve tribes of Israel. Now think about that and how that parallels to Jesus. This is no accident. In the book of Revelation, at the end of times, Jesus will be the ultimate warrior that fights the forces of evil. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His name is called the Word of God, and the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he has on his robe, and on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This passage is clearly referencing Jesus. He judges and makes war. His name is called the Word of God. The armies in heaven followed him on white horses. He should strike the nations. He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So contextually, the connection between Joshua and Jesus are that they both fought the battles to get us into the Promised Land. That connection is there on purpose. But does it end there? Nope. I promised you a Hebrew lesson, and here is where we get to know the deeper story. In Hebrew, the name for Joshua is Yehoshua. Hebrew's consonants are on the top with the vowels underneath them. It reads from right to left. We have a yod with a shiva under it. That gives you the ya sound. Then a he followed by a holam vav. That gives you the ho sound. Now we have a sheen with the vowel kibbits under it. That gives us the shu. And finally, an ayin followed by the vowel patek at the end. That gives us the ah sound. Now remember, we're reading from right to left, and together, that makes Yehoshua. We know that names have a lot of meaning in Hebrew from their root words. The name of Joshua can be split up into two root words. The first part is unmistakable. The yod and the he, yeh, are clearly referencing a form of the tetragram, Yahweh, the name of God. 
you will see lots of names in Hebrew with the Ye or Ya in it. Those are representing a message about God. The second part of the name Oshua is from the verb Yasha, meaning to save or deliver. So the name Joshua literally means God saves or even God is salvation. In noting how Joshua fights to get God's chosen people into the promised land, then you can see how the name fits perfectly into the story of Joshua. Now we get into the story of Jesus. I won't get too deep into how the name Jesus evolved. The Israelites originally spoke Hebrew. Then Hebrew became more of the formal speech relegated to the temple and reading of the scriptures. The language of Aramaic was more common at the time of Jesus, and most people spoke that language. But before the Romans took over, the Greeks were the world's superpower, and they Hellenized the people and their cultures. So Koine Greek was the language that the New Testament and all the Gospels were written in. Then, after the death of Jesus, the books of the Bible were translated into Latin and then English, and somewhere along the way, the name Jesus came about. But that wasn't the name that he was called while he was here on earth. Since Jesus had used so many Aramaic words and phrases in the Gospels, nearly all scholars agree that Jesus spoke Aramaic, the common language at the time of his ministry. And we're going to look at the Hebrew version of the Aramaic name for Jesus. And that is Yeshua. Let's analyze it. We have the Yod and a Sere, that gives you the Ya sound. Then the Sheen and next to it a Shurek, that gives you the Shu sound. Then the Ayan and a Patak, which is the A sound. And from right to left, that makes Yeshua. And that looks awfully familiar to the name of Yehoshua in Hebrew. Let's place them side by side. You have the Ya, the Shu, and the A, which are the same in both names. The only difference between the two names is Joshua has the He and the Holom Vav, which makes the sound Ho. That will make sense once we talk about Joshua's name change. You see, his name was Hoshua before Moses changed it to Yehoshua. But the difference between the two names, Yeshua and Yehoshua, are just the differences between the two languages, Hebrew and Aramaic. When the Israelites were taken captive and went into exile in Babylon, they adapted and started speaking the language of Aramaic. We can see the influence of Aramaic on Joshua's name, Yehoshua. After the exile in Nehemiah 8.17, when the Israelites were back in Jerusalem, this verse clearly mentions the name Joshua. We know that since they cite the same father. And once we zoom in on that name, we can see how the language was evolving because Yehoshua is referred to as Yeshua. So that confirms that the name Yehoshua was evolving due to the Israelites using a new language. So the names Joshua and Jesus are just separated by language. They're actually the same name and mean the same thing in Hebrew. God is salvation. So not only contextually are their stories the same, the names connect and match perfectly as well. And again, I think that's on purpose. Now you can see this research done in many places. It's cool, but nothing revelatory. But on this channel, we look at connections. And in this case, the deeper story is in the structure of the language itself. As we just mentioned, Joshua got his name from Moses. This is mentioned when Joshua was one of the Israelites sent as spies into the promised land. These are the names of the men whom Moses sent out to spy out the land. And Moses called Hoshua, the son of Nun, Joshua. Joshua's real name was Hoshua, but his name was changed by Moses. Again, in Hebrew, the name Hoshua is derived from the root word Yasha, meaning to be saved or salvation. So Moses took his name Hoshua, meaning salvation, and added God to it, Yehoshua. Adding God to salvation is a meaningful name change for Moses. But we're going to focus on something else in that verse, and that's the name of his father, Nun. In Hebrew, there is a verb noon that means to propagate or increase. But remember when I said that the language that Jesus spoke was Aramaic? This is where it gets interesting. In Aramaic, the word for noon means fish. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we know that biblically, the fathers were the ones listed in nearly all the genealogies to bring forth their children. This is where we get the word begot from, or as you can see the present tense, beget. It's the Hebrew word yalad, which means to bear or bring forth. That's the standard definition, but I'm going to add another angle, which will be a little bit more precise within the context of the whole Bible. In the story of Abraham, when he was worried that his wife Sarah had not given birth to a child, he spoke with God that a servant was going to end up being his heir. Then God replies to him, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. 
That is not some insignificant thing. This was after the Tower of Babel and how mankind had again rebelled against God and the seed of Abraham coming from not only his own body, but also the seed from his marriage with Sarah that would produce the chosen descendant line through Isaac. That was of the most importance to God. How about another important person in the Bible, David? David wanted to build the house of God. But since he had shed so much blood in his life, God was going to choose a son of David to establish the Davidic kingdom. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Again, another significant birth of a son and the emphasis from God that it will come from your own body. This is a really important point. In fact, you can even add in the context of Jesus Christ himself. Here's the most famous verse in the whole Bible, John 3, 16. He gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ was begotten because he came out from God. That is how he has the same essence of God and is considered to be God himself. So that is the larger context of God's plan. So if we understand the word begot that way, then let us apply to the genealogy of Joshua. In the story of Joshua, we know from the Bible that Joshua's father was Nun. So using the biblical format, Nun begot Joshua, who in Hebrew is Yehoshua. Next, we're going to take the Aramaic definition of Nun, which is fish, and say that the fish brought forth Yehoshua. You can see where this is going. Then we're going to add in the more refined definition of the word begot, came out from, and reword this to say that Yehoshua came out from a fish. Now, what does that sound like? Yep, the story of Jonah, the prophet who also came out from a fish. So once again, we have a biblical story built into the structure of the names in the Bible. This is so cool. And remember how we spoke about the stories of Joshua and Jesus being the same contextually, and even that their names matched? We established with the Nehemiah verse that the name Yehoshua in Hebrew had changed in Aramaic to be Yeshua, which was the name that Jesus was called. So if you place the Aramaic version of Joshua in here, then you can even say that Yeshua came out from a fish, which fully brings Jesus into the structural story about Jonah. And this gives a lot more depth to when Jesus said, you will have a prophet greater than Jonah in him. And this gives a deeper meaning when Jesus told his apostles, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And remember how Jesus paralleled this story with Jonah's and how they will both spend three days and three nights, Jonah in the fish and Jesus dead in the cave? Well, after Jesus resurrects, after those three days, at the end of the Gospel of John, he visits the disciples for the third time. And guess where they are? They were fishing. <laughs> it's so awesome how God's story connects in so many ways. The deeper you go, the more incredible God's story is. So that is how the name and stories of Joshua, Jonah, and Jesus fit together to tell a connected story built into the structure of language itself. Amazing. Later this year, we'll talk more about the connections to the prophet Jonah and the fish. I hope you enjoyed this video, and may God bless you all.